Oh, shucks, guys. I'm, I'm blushing. Thank you. Um, so, hi. My name is Christian Jenko, uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention briefly why you should listen to me, although I think my mom did a great job of talking me up. Um, second, I'm going to talk about why you should go to college, which is actually very important in making colleges want you to go there. Third, I'm going to talk about what colleges look for and how to make them want you. And lastly, I'm going to talk about how you can hack the system, how you can do that extra little bit to get a lot more. Uh, so firstly, why you should listen to me. Here's kind of my resume that I, I gave to colleges. I graduated Carroll High School in 2009 with a 101.0000 GPA which I was really happy about. Uh, I got 2280 on my SAT and 33 on my ACT. Uh, I got fives on the AP tests in biochem, physics, and English comp, and fours in English lit, psychology, AP US history, econ, and calculus. Um, I was also extracurricularly a green jacket student ambassador. This is someone who kind of goes around and goes to all the events and uh, talks about the school. I was voted uh, the best actor of 2008 Thespian Society. I did uh, some theater on the side. Uh, I won several ACM coding competitions in computer science. And I produced and directed the film Game Over, which involved hundreds of community volunteers. It was like firefighters. I was terrified. I was like this 14-year-old kid telling, oh, yes, you, Mr. Chief of Police, please stand over here and say these lines. And he was like, OK. Um, when I graduated, I was offered $2.3 million in combined scholarship money from 36 universities. These are the universities. Write them down as quick as you can and stop. Uh, <laughs> The one that I finally chose was the SMU President Scholarship, which just happened to be worth the most amount of money out of all of those. Uh, it was worth, at the time, $180,000, but over the course of my four years there, they raised tuition several times, and it ended up being worth about $210,000. This also included uh, full tuition, all student fees, so I never paid a student fee while I was there. It included room and board, so I ate for free for four years. It was great. Uh, study abroad and tuition for traveling, which was fantastic. I'll get into that in a second. Um, and weekend vacations to Taos every year with other president scholars, because why not? Uh, total, over the four years that I was there, I spent about $10,000. Most of that was spent while studying abroad on extra stuff that I didn't really need to do, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, I majored in computer science with a pre-medical specialization, which was already mentioned. Um, also, extracurricularly, while I was in college, I was a student representative for the Lyle School of Engineering on uh, the Student Senate. I did African hand drumming, which was so much fun. Uh, I'm a member of the Mile High Club now on the rock wall, which is really cool. I have a t-shirt that I wear sometimes. Uh, and I did modern dance, which was a lot of fun. Ballroom dancing, we did competitions in, in Austin and stuff. Uh, I gained moderate fame by doing this musical eating thing. Which is, that's what I was on uh, Good Morning Texas for. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I ended up winning the... Uh, the student talent show. Um, and I also gave a talk at the uh, TEDx SMU conference about why everyone should learn to program. This is really cool because people will email me now all the time saying, oh my god, I saw your talk. It was great. I'm learning to program now. And I'm like, that's great. I feel so cool. And they're from New Zealand, this person that I never would have met before. Um, study abroad, which SMU paid for most of for. I went all over the place. Thailand, Bali, Vietnam, Malaysia. Uh, Hong Kong, I took a trip to Sydney, I was in Perth uh, for a long while. These pictures are not lining up at all with what I'm saying. Uh, this was in Bali, this is Australia, this is in Sydney, uh, the Sydney Opera House, this is like in the middle of Australia. I uh, took a summer in Oxford, so I, got to, it, I can put on my resume now that, yes, I was a student of Oxford University. Um, got to see, it was actually the summer that the Olympics were there, so we got to see the, the torch coming through. Uh, Stonehenge, got to see like all the, all the stuff. While we were there, we took a trip to France and to uh, Ireland, which was, so all that, most of it was paid for by SMU, it was fantastic. Also, a great opportunity of this program was that I got to meet some really, really cool people. These are two of my idols. It's Jill Bolte Taylor on the left, who gave a TED Talk, A Stroke of Insight. It's fantastic if you haven't seen it. Um, and on the right, Neil freaking DeGrasse Tyson, like my hero, this guy shook his head. I talked to him for like 10 minutes, it was, it was fantastic. Uh, for postgrad, which is right now, I graduated debt-free. I'm, I'm completely free of debt in college. I have deferred admission to several Texas medical schools. Probably not going to pursue that because technology and software engineering is going really well. Um, so I'm, I'm probably going to stay on that. So uh, with that, I would like to talk for a second about why you should go to college. Why do most people want to go to college? And I bring this up because I read this book recently called How to Get Rich by Felix Dennis. He's one of the richest people in the world, a media mogul. He, he owns every newspaper magazine that you've ever read. 
And what struck me about this book was that the first four chapters about how to get rich were about why you don't really want to get rich. It talks about the reasons why people want to get rich, that they want happiness and they want freedom and they want success and they want respect by their peers and they, they don't want to have to go to work when they don't want to. But his point was you don't need to be rich to get those things. You can be happy with any amount of money. Um, you don't have to go to college by the same token to be happy or successful. I think uh, it, it may be, because in, in research for this talk, it's really in the last 50 years that this has become a, just the thing that like, you have to go to college. This is something that you have to do. And I think, based on my research, that this has a lot to do with this game called the Game of Life, in which it is impossible to win if you do not go to college. I know, I've run simulations on it. I've played it like 20,000 times. You can't win, statistically, if you don't go to college. But life is not life. Life is not the game of life. Uh, you know, we, we were kind of fed this pattern of you go to middle, middle school, then after that is high school, and then college. You go to college so you can get into a good internship. You get an internship so you can get a good job, and then you can get married so that you can have kids and you can pay off your student loans. Then you have to pay off your mortgage, and then you have to save money for your kid's college, and then you have to save money for retirement. And then finally, when you're like 70 years old and you've paid off all these things, you can finally retire in Florida with all these old, ugly people. Uh, <laughs> So, let's talk about the reasons why people say that they want to go to college. The first, of course, is to make money, to be successful, because you have to go to college to make enough money to, to achieve that list of things, and college is, is already in that list. The second is to, to prepare for a career. All the good careers you need a college degree for, so of course you have to go to college if you want to get the good career, if you want to have the good job, etc. Uh, the third that you hear much less often, that it's kind of scary, is to learn. You go to college to learn and, and to be motivated in learning. And the last uh, that I've heard from a lot of my friends is, oh, you need the college experience and you have to meet people and you have to get that socialization. You can't really get that anywhere else. Um, and the last reason that you hear least frequently is research. You go to college to go and, and do research and to be a, an undergraduate researcher. So let's dissect these one by one. Uh, the first is to make money or be successful. Now. There's this article by Mr. Money Mustache, who's this great blogger. He, he uh, retired when he was 30 years old after software programming. Um, but he talks about, he, he has this great blog post. It's one of its, his most popular that talks about 50 different careers that make over $50,000 that you don't need a college degree for. And these are things like a real estate agent or like really unglamorous things that people don't really think about, like a plumber or a software designer, you don't need a college degree to be a software designer, or a food truck owner, a professional blogger, a YouTuber, which I thought was kind of funny, a carpenter, mechanic, these are all like really in-demand jobs that you can make a killing on that no one really thinks about. Now the reason why $50,000 was chosen is that the average salary for a college graduate is $45,000. So in these careers, Without debt, you don't have to pay for going to college. You can make more money than the average college graduate. Um, and I would argue, if you went to college and then tried to pursue a career, you would be less valuable to an employer or to society as a whole if you decided to do kind of the freelance thing um, than if you spent those four years actually doing the thing that you want to be doing. Accounting. If you go to college and major in accounting, you know a lot of the theoretical stuff, you know a lot of the theory behind it, but you're not really good at accounting yet. Whereas if you spent four years doing accounting, if you, you know, worked for a small business and handled all of their finances, that could be a better experience, I would argue, than going to college and majoring in it. Um, another really terrifying statistic of college graduates, this graph on the right here is the percentage of college graduates who are working in a field in which a college degree is needed. So only 62%, if you graduate college, you have a 62% chance of actually ending up in a field where you needed that college degree but you're also like $100,000 in debt. The one on the right is uh, people who have graduated college who are in this 62%, this who are in a field that requires a college degree that's not related to their, or, sorry, that's related to their major. So the majority of it, even if you get in this blue chunk on the left, chances are you're not gonna end up in a field that was the field that you majored in. Um, on that, on, uh, so preparing for a career was the, the second point of why you should go to college. This is great. This is a great idea if you're majoring in a field in which a college degree is necessary. Not to discourage you from college. I'm, I'm all about college and learning. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in petroleum engineering, 
College is a great place to be right now. Petroleum engineers make a killing, and they have a lot of fun doing it. If you major in petroleum engineering, your degree pays for itself in like six months. Same with uh, you know mathematics, if you're majoring in anything nuclear, a lot of computer-related fields. On the flip side of that, though, these people are paying the exact same amount as a petroleum engineer for their degree. But if you're majoring in culinary arts, your degree costs the same amount of money as a petroleum engineer, but it's going to take you 50 years, to, not, not exactly 50 years, it's going to take you a long time to make up uh, the, the cost of your degree. The next reason is to learn or to motivate learning. Uh, so to, if, if you're going to college to learn, I would bring up the point that colleges are no longer a monopoly on the place where you're learning. It used to be that there were these monasteries that were locked up and you had to go there to get the knowledge, but now we have Khan Academy, and we have Coursera, and we have Wikipedia, things that you can go online and you can learn better. I know, I've been to college, I've, I've had both you know, the, the classroom experience and Khan Academy. Most of my peers in college learn better from Khan Academy, learn better from these, these individualized sources than they do from college. Um, and I brought this point up that if you learn by doing, you're more competitive. Uh, also, if you're going to college to, to motivate you to learn, that's a really bad reason to go to college. Um, if you need that motivation and you're willing to pay that much just to be motivated to learn, please hire me for about $100 an hour. I'll stand behind you with a stick, and if you stop working, I'll just, I'll just hit you. And you'll come out financially ahead, and we'll both, we'll both benefit. It'll be great. Um, the, the next thing is to meet people for the college experience. Again, this is a really expensive way to socialize. Um, I would, I would implore you to spend $20,000 throwing parties and traveling. You'll get a much better social experience. You won't have to deal with class the next morning. You know, you, you won't have to worry about, about the, the not performing well in, in school, and you'll have a better experience. Um, the last reason that I brought up is research. Research, if you're interested in going to college for research, that is a fantastic reason to go to college. Universities are the best place to do research. Here's a, a quick example. This is all of human knowledge in a circle. This is what you learn in elementary school. This is what you learn in high school. You learn kind of a little bit more in the, in the generalized knowledge. In college, you major. You, you kind of specialize in something, and you move towards the edge of the gap, uh, move towards the edge of what we know uh, in humanity. If you keep going, if you get your master's, you reach out a little bit further. You continue specializing. With research papers, you're writing them and reading them, and you're really on the forefront of this thing, and you're, you're on the, the edge of human knowledge. Then you focus and you get right in there and you spend years just trying to push that boundary just a little bit further. And to you, the world looks like this. <laughs> and this is called your PhD. If this excites you, and it should, because like human knowledge, you can push it forward. You can add to, to what we know cumulatively as a species. College is great. That's exactly where you should be. Um, on the flip side, if... if None of the reasons that I brought up kind of resonated with you. I would argue that college is largely, at least financially, a waste of money. The average cost of tuition for a public school is $22,000 a year. For a private school, it's $43,000, so you know, almost twice as much. Let's focus on public. Plus room and board, which is about $9,000, plus textbooks, which over, uh, over a semester or over a year can be about $1.2,000 times four years. We are at $128,800. For the sake of math, let's call this $130,000. At a public school, average cost of public tuition, once you're said and done, once you've paid for everything else, it's going to be about $130,000. Is college the best use? If I gave you $130,000 right now in a, in a sketchy briefcase, is the best thing that you could possibly do with it to go to college? If on the other hand, you invested in mutual funds, which return about like 6% every year annually. In 10 years, that $130,000 is going to double, and it's going to continue earning interest. So after 10 years, you'll be making $10,000 in passive annual income, which is 866 <laughs> passive dollars that just come to you, no work on your part. You can sit on the couch all day and watch TV if you wanted to, and you'll still get $866 a month. That's enough to retire on if you can live frugally. Assuming, you know, if you were making money during those 10 years, you could have double that. That's more, that you can, you can comfortably retire. Um, $130,000, if you go to college, 
is kind of like withdrawing this amount of money, four $50 bills, every single morning from the bank, and before each of your classes, you hand your professor one of those $50 bills, and you say, yes, please teach me for the next hour, um, and then you leave, and that's, that's college, that's how much college costs. That's enough for a four-hour Miley Cyrus concert. <laughs> Is, is a single class, and college classes, contrary to what all your teachers are telling you, college classes are not that much different than high school classes in terms of academics. There's still, you know, people sleeping in class, and <laughs> it's, it's about the same. So if you do go to college, you have to have a really good reason why. You have to really love this environment of classroom learning to be willing to pay the same amount that you would pay for a four-hour Miley Cyrus concert for every single one of your lectures. You should approach learning in every single one of your classes like it is the most interesting thing in the world. Because if you, if you love your classes so much that you'll pay $50 per class to do it, you need to love it. You need to love it like my brother Justin loves Minecraft. <laughs> he is amazing. At, this kid is a, is a savant at Minecraft. I have sat down and watched him play this game. He's on like the top ranked server for this it's amazing. He, he ha you have to like jump up and kill other people while they're trying to kill you and there's different races. This kid knows every statistic of everything about Minecraft. He could have a PhD in Minecraft now. Right? He loves it. He knows everything about all the lore of the different mob characters and all the different aspects of the different powers of the different units and how those complement each other. It's like a really complicated game. It's amazing. Um, think about something that you are this passionate about. And imagine you're in a room with 30 other people that are just as passionate as you are about it. And there's an expert in the front of the room that will come there every day. And he'll, he'll talk to you about the expert things about Minecraft or whatever it is that you're passionate about. And you can swap strategies and you can, you can kind of explore this different space and you can compete with each other and get better. And you can, you can become like the best people in the world at Minecraft or at whatever it is that you're passionate about. You think this is ridiculous because I'm, I'm talking about a video game and you, you can't be this passionate about something that you're learning in school, but think about, think about biology. Biology in high school may be kind of boring because you're memorizing all these lists of things and it's kind of root and you, you don't really like it, but think about what biology is. Biology is us as a humanity have discovered the secret of life. We've, we've like cracked the code. We know how it works. And we can teach you how it works. And, you know, sometime probably in the next decade, we're going to be able to synthesize anything. We could just make an animal, and it could exist from nothing. We could make Pokemon. You could be the person that makes Pokemon happen. That's amazing. And this is, this is, the, this is the, uh, the, the fervor and the excitement that you should have going into any class. Because this is, this is like knowledge. This is learning. It's fun. Um, on uh, one, one minor point, it's kind of socially accepted as the norm that everyone goes to college in America. I'd like to point out that this is not generally the case abroad, especially in Australia. It's much more common and, and more socially acceptable to go to one of these trade schools like TAF uh, in the UK. There's, a, there's an analog in, the, in Australia. I'm sorry, TAF is Australia. There's an analog in the UK. Um, so now that I've gotten that out of the way, I hope I have with me a lot of a group of people who have found their reason, their core reason, that yes, I do want to go to college, this is something that I want, and there is not a better alternative. If you're there with me, this is how you go to college for free. Once you're in this place where you can prove to a college that you do not need college to be successful, colleges will pay you to come to their school. It's amazing. Uh, so it's, it's dead simple also. There's four different areas. The first is curriculum GPA. These are all weighted approximately equally. Your test scores, which include uh, SAT primarily, or ACT, it, it, they're weighted about equally, um, and your AP scores, which are less so. And then subjective things. The, so these three categories are weighted about equally on the, on the score sheet. I've sat on the interview committee. This is, this is how they do things. This is, this is an application for college. This is what you put together. That's you. Um, and it, it's these three things. Subjective things include leadership. If you did any leadership things in high school, that's a huge thing. That's just a checkbox on the form that we, yes, they were in a leadership role. Um, if you did any activities like debate or band or cheer or sports. Um, and finally, your essay. Of these things, considering the amount of time that you put into them, the essay is probably the most important part. This is what the application looks like. This is the front page of this, this application. And it's just a list of numbers. And this is, this is you to colleges. You're a sheet of numbers. Um, the most important box on this sheet is this one right here. It says... 
curriculum. So how hard was your curriculum? Did you take a lot of AP classes? Did you challenge yourself? It says your GPA, and it's not the school GPA. It's, they don't say like, oh, yes, you had 101.000. No, they weighed it on their own scale. It's probably zero to four, whatever the school does. Um, your test scores, so AP classes and, and all that stuff, um, and SATs. Subjective stuff, if you were volunteering and you did the homeless shelter, that's fantastic, but you know, it's on this sheet, that just gets you a five. It's, it's another number. Um, and then they average those, and that's the overall score. So let's break these down. The curriculum and GPA. How do you maximize this? How do you get the highest curriculum and GPA? This is actually one of the easiest parts of this. Um, again, if you love classes so much that you're willing to pay $50 a class to go to them, you should really enjoy going to class. Don't treat it as, you know, people kind of in high school do this brain dump thing where they cram right before the exam and then they forget everything right after. Approach it like it's something that you actually want to retain. Approach learning like it's information that you want to acquire. It doesn't have to be rote. It doesn't have to be tedious. If you're memorizing vocab words, don't think about it as, yes, I have to memorize all these words so I do well in the quiz. Think about it as, Yes, I'm going to memorize all these words so I can impress all the ladies with my vocabulary. <laughs> um, don't, don't force it. I mean, like it. Uh, uh, approach it like it's something valuable. Um, take challenging classes and do well in them. It's, it's simple. Um, put the time into it that you need to and, and do well in these classes. Again, learn because you love learning. Um, class rank is... is sweated by a lot of people, they're, they're kind of gaming the system and saying, oh yes, well, I have to study this many hours for this test so I can, I can beat Susie McGregor at this test and have a higher class rank than her. It's more important to actually be learning and to learn because you love learning. And that shows in your interview, it shows in your essay, it shows in your entire application. We would, 99 times out of 100, much prefer someone with, you know, a, a 3, 4 GPA who really, we could see, like, loved learning. They took the hardest classes they could, and they loved what they were learning. Then someone who was valedictorian, who had a 4.0 GPA, who was just kind of this machine that just knew how to test really well. Um, the, the machine that tests really well will get into really good colleges, and she'll get really good scholarships, but it's, it's better to be a more well-rounded person and to, to learn for the sake of learning. Um, second thing is test scores. I cannot stress this enough. Test scores are the most important part of your application. National merit, the National Merit Scholarship, they don't talk about a lot in high school, but if you do well on the PSAT when you're a junior in high school, colleges by default will just give you free money. No extra work, nothing, doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, what race you are, how many extracurriculars you did. If you, do, if you get a certain score on the PSAT, you just get scholarships automatically from colleges. So think of this as this is your job until you go to college. Uh, you're making money when you're studying for these tests. Now, what is a good score? Well, it's actually published online. It's, it's really easy. Um, it fluctuates every year. If you can score above a 220, you're probably going to get national merit. Um, you're probably going to be a national merit scholar. I took this test in, <laughs> in 2009. I got a 215 which, as you can see, that would have gotten it in, in 2011. The cutoff that year was a 216. <laughs> I missed national merit by like one question. <laughs> and that would have been an additional scholarship in addition to my full ride. SMU would have just written me a check every year for $6,000, just free money, there you go. But I, I got the one question wrong. It, every morning I wake up, ah, that, that one question, the hypotenuse, ah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a great PSAT and SAT score is easy. It's very easy to study for these tests. You'll talk to some people and they'll say, oh, you can't study for these tests. It's about your intelligence. And it, no, that's, that's wrong. Here's how you study for the test. I'll, I'll save you the $6,000 that you would have spent on the, on the um, prep course. Here's a book on Amazon. It costs uh, $5 with shipping. It's called 12 Practice Tests to the SAT. Here's the secret to doing really well on the PSAT and the SAT. Buy this book, and then take all of the tests. <laughs> Here's the, the flow that you go through. You take a test, you go back over the test, and you review the question that you got wrong. And SAT is not that long. It's like, you know, it's, it's a weekend. You spend, whatever, four hours in a, on a Saturday. You do that for four weeks. You've just done four SATs. 
Um, after you take the test, the answers are in the back of the book. Go through it, review the questions you got wrong, make a note of it. But then find out why you got it wrong. Don't just say, ah, oh, another question about the hypotenuse again. I, whatever, I'll just get that question. No, like find out why you got that question wrong and learn what you didn't know. And then repeat that. Just keep doing that. Um, so if you get a vocab question wrong because you didn't know an SAT vocabulary word, look up all the SAT vocabulary words and learn them. There's like a thousand of them. But like, learn 10 a day. <laughs> it's easy. It's free online. Um, if you get a question wrong about trigonometry, go to khanacademy.org. They have a series on, on trigonometry. It's like two hours of lectures. If you had an awful math teacher, I don't, I don't mean to offend anyone if everyone's a math teacher in this room. If you, if you didn't maybe absorb trigonometry as well as you should have, um, go on this website. You can learn it in like two hours. It's not necessarily easy. It's, it's a difficult, but it's not out of your grasp. Like You can learn trigonometry on your own. Um, same thing goes with AP tests. Uh, a really cool thing that I saw a lot of my friends doing, uh, in well, the, the kids that got the scholarships in college, what a lot of them would do was even if their schools didn't offer AP tests, and even if they didn't have room for them in their, in their curriculum, they would just buy the review book, go through the review book, take all the practice tests, do the same system that I was talking about before, where you take the test and you go over what you got wrong. You can get a four or a five in a month of studying if you just buy the review book. You don't need to take the class. You're just studying for the test. Um, the last thing is subjective stuff. This is a checkbox on your application. Um, but where this really shines is showing when you apply that this is something that you're really passionate about. So don't just be in band because that's like what all your friends are doing and that's, you know, this is like where I hang out. Pursue things because you love doing them. That's what we're looking for in these applications when we review people. Passion. We want to see like you're doing something because you love it. Because if given the choice between doing that or any other thing, you would do that. If, if I would pay you $1,000 not to do that right now, you would still keep doing that even in high school. Um, the most important subjective thing is the essay. This is the only part of your application where we actually see you as a person instead of just a number. What we're looking for is to see that you're different. We, wanna, we want you to set yourself apart from everyone else on the application. I want to see that you are an interesting and entertaining person. Forget everything that you learned about writing essays in, in English class. There's kind of a set formula of you do the body paragraph and that, no, forget it. Like, be creative. Do something original. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and show me. Don't tell me. So don't say in your essay, my name is Christian Jenko and I am a very hardworking person. No. <laughs> tell me. Paint a picture. Tell me about a time when you worked harder than you had ever worked before in your life and you were ragged and you were tired and you just wanted to give up and everyone else around you was giving up, but you kept working. You did not stop. You're, you're voracious. You are such a hard worker, you don't even need to say the word work. Like, describe it for me. Tell me about it. And be memorable. Put, put like, little quirks in there, little personal anecdotes. I, I'll give you a, a great example that I still think is hilarious. My essay that I wrote, that I'll read for you in a second, um, was about Mac versus PC. It's like Mac computers versus PC computers. <laughs> Um, which at the time, like it was the it was the Mac versus PC ads that were coming out, so it was a, it was kind of a controversial topic. Um, <clears throat> I went into a counselor's office after I was already in SMU, probably two years after I had applied. Um, this random office in the engineering school, and I, I needed some stupid form filled out for something I was doing. And I walked in and I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah my name is Christian Jenko. Like I'm here to see this person." And the woman there said, "Christian Jenko, Christian." You wrote that Mac versus PC essay. And I was like, oh my god, that was two years ago. Um, so I'll, I'll read you the essay that I wrote right now. Uh, not to say this is, this is not the greatest essay ever, but it, it hits the points that I think an essay should hit. The prompt for this was, evaluate a significant experience, achievement, risk you have taken, or ethical dilemma you have faced, and its impact on you. <clears throat> Unbeknownst to the majority of the human population, an epic war has been waging for decades between two distinct ideologies concerning the future of human technological development. Mac versus PC. It might seem silly to an outside observer, but operating system, or OS, preference is as hot an issue in the geek community as religion is in the real world. My side of the battle was predestined the day my family brought, bought our first iMac when I was nine years old. I can still remember the mythical white cubic box it came in. I still have it hidden away in our attic. 
My growing excitement as my father slowly unpackaged the layered peripherals and the glorious moment when I was allowed the honor of pressing the oddly satisfying power button on its side and heard the Mac OS boot up sound, an ominous <laughs> For two years, I explored every file and folder of Mac OS 9. I learned how to import pictures of my two younger sisters and Photoshop their heads onto monkeys. <laughs> Record my voice with the built-in microphone and modulate the pitch to make me sound more awesome. And I even surpassed my dad's knowledge of the new machine, though he had read and outlined the entire manual the first day. And I helped him install new printers and fix email and network problems. A few years and several computers after that, I was a self-proclaimed Macintosh expert. Since I was homeschooled, I, have plenty, I had plenty of free time to teach myself every aspect of Macintosh computing. There was nothing I couldn't do and nothing I couldn't fitch, fix. Glitches on my mom's laptop would be solved with a whizzing combination of key presses. Video editing was a breeze after teaching myself Apple's Final Cut Express software inside and out. I even picked up a few simple programming languages just by playing around with Apple's built-in text editor. However, being homeschooled largely sheltered me from the OS everyone else was using at the time, Windows XP. I was barely exposed to the alternative US until my first year of high school, where I was suddenly knocked back to a novice computer user. I joined the technology club because I thought I would be able to fix the teacher's computer problems with the same ease as I could with my mom's computer. But I found myself almost as lost as the teachers were. I had no idea how to do anything on the school's PC computers. And that's when it happened. This is ridiculous, I shouted in the computer lab after school during a tech meeting. Why doesn't the printer just work when I plug it in? Why is Internet Explorer so awful at CSS rendering? And why do I click the start button to shut off the computer? <laughs> Everyone in the room immediately went on the offensive, unanimously attacking Apple's one-button mouse, their lack of third-party software, their overpriced hardware, their incompatibility with the rest of the world, and anything else they could stick, sink, sink their teeth into. I had no idea anyone could react, could react this strongly to a little, a little outburst of frustration. Afterwards, I talked to them individually and found out that they were all in some way tied to Windows nearly as loyally as I was to Mac. Some of them had parents whose professions depended on computer languages that only worked on Windows. I learned to understand my classmates through my own experiences and realized that the, the connection between them and their operating system was just as strong as my love of Mac. Since then, I've made it a point whenever I'm in an argument to take a step back and analyze the opposing viewpoint until I could see logical justification behind it. I learned that the most effective argument was one that takes the pros and cons of both sides into account, not one that just dismisses everything they don't agree with, that doesn't agree with the conclusion. The next year, Technology Club was given a video project involving over 300 community volunteers to raise awareness of drunk driving. I was elected the director and video editor and pr produced the project with Final Cut Pro entirely on a Mac. Although I don't think I managed to convert anyone else, I'd like to think I had a part in the school's decision to install a 30-computer Mac lab the next semester. So that's not, it's not the greatest essay. It's not incredibly well-written. I would write it, probably, I would tweak a lot of things now. But it got across, you know, I had this passion, this thing that I was passionate about. I wanted to show in the essay that I was kind of, a, you know, an understanding person, that I was empathetic, that I could take a full situation into account. But I didn't say, I am an empathetic person. I can take a full situation into account. I described a situation in which I thought I demonstrated that. Um, here are general tips for the, the entire application as a whole. Your application, you should think of as a set of talking points. Anything that you put on your application, you should be excited and, and comfortable with talking about in a good you know, five-minute conversation. I'll give you a, a really quick example. Uh, I was interviewing someone this last semester who had written on their application uh, that they had done a research project at UC Southwestern. And during the project, uh, they listed like, you know, experiences and, and expertise of things they learned. And they listed Python, the programming language, and LaTeX, spelled L-A-T-E-X, mis commonly mispronounced as, as LaTeX. Does anyone here know LaTeX? Is anyone like a, like a research thing? It's a really, es yes! You're the first person to ever, ah, oh, that makes me so happy. Um, so it's, <laughs> It's this really esoteric language. It's, it's like only used in these, these things of research, but it's really cool. So I, I saw this and I said, oh my God, this kid knows LaTeX. This is so cool. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw him this softball and we can, he can talk about how he learned LaTeX and you know, it, it'll be, he'll sound really impressive in front of the other interviewers. <laughs> So the interview rolls around, and, I, and you know, we're kind of talking and chatting, and oh, band, and blah, blah, blah. And I say, so could you tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with, with LaTeX for this research project? And he said, what? 
And I said, oh, oh, LaTeX. It, it's LaTeX, L-A-T-E-X. And he, oh, what, what? And I was like, did I, did I get the wrong form? Is this the wrong, oh, uh, you know, uh, and then the other view, interviewer kind of stepped in and saved me and said, oh, Christian, why don't, why don't you, like, tell us a little bit about what that is so, for us non-tech people? So I said, oh, it's this formatting thing for doing it. I'm, like, looking at this kid, hoping I, hoping I'd, I'd get some recognition somewhere. Nothing. So after the interview, the rest of it, the rest of it goes okay. After the other, there were three other interviewers, and they, they said to me, hey, what, what was that LaTeX thing? Like, what happened? And I flipped to page five on his, like, the bottom of his resume, and I said, right here, like it says, I'm not crazy. It's the list of LaTeX is one of his expertise things. He didn't get the scholarship. Um, I hope it wasn't because of that question, because I would feel really bad, but uh, it, it didn't help him. So things that you put on your application should be things that you're comfortable talking about. Please don't be... Don't be my next LaTeX story um, in your interview. Uh, you want to show also, just as a general thing, this is kind of in general with, with uh, leadership activities that you do and, and extracurriculars. The reason why you're showing this is to show that you have good time management, because that's why most people fail in college. You want to show that you're able to handle a lot of different things well, um, and show that you're well-rounded, that you have multiple vested interests. Also, apply early. That gives you a, a quick and easy advantage. Um, this is a quick thing about uh, professor evaluations. This is the form that they fill out when you send them the common application. It just lists, you know, a bunch of different things about you, your academic achievement, your intellectual promise, your quality of writing, your if you're creative, your original thought, if you uh, produce class uh, discussion, if you respect accorded by faculty. Anyway, it's those things. They, they rate you one to five. Um, as a general rule of thumb, Math teachers will rate you really highly, but they'll write about you really poorly. They'll usually have just like one form template letter that they find and replace the student's name. Um, sometimes they miss one and it's the wrong name. Uh, but English teachers will write about you really well, but rate you much worse. So try to balance that out. I don't know why that is. Um, so the third part of my talk, how to hack the system. You now know that you need to have a very good reason to go to college. You need to... Uh, be able to maximize the, the key areas. It's very simple. There's three different things you need to maximize. So work, it's your full-time job to maximize those. Here's how you can cheat a little bit. Every school has the scholarship drawer. This is little tiny scholarships, sometimes like $500, sometimes like $3,000, that you go to your guidance office and you say, hey, can I see your scholarship drawer? Can I apply for some of these little scholarships? And these are usually done by independent businesses um, that say, yeah, you know, we have some extra money, we'd like to sponsor a, a child to go to college. It usually doesn't matter what college you go to. Sometimes they'll be really weird, like, you have to be a four foot nine person with Irish descent, and you have to love whiskey. Um, there's a scholarship, like, so find the ones that apply to you, and apply for all of them. If you, you know, you're, you're making money while you're doing this. I did a, a quick calculation. Uh, if you spend, like, you know, four hours a week just writing essays. This is the only time in your life where you can make money writing like 400 word essays. You can make $70 an hour as a high school student going towards your college. As a small anecdote, my mom uh, is on the board for the Garden Club. Last year they had three $3,000 scholarships that they were giving out. To anyone who was going to college, you just had to fill out an essay, you had to fill out a short form, and I think you had to like get a, a letter of recommendation from someone. They had three of these for $3,000. They had two people apply. <laughs> Guess who got the scholarships? <laughs> the two people that applied. Um, so just apply for all of them. You can, you can make money like crazy. Um, so I showed you earlier uh, my, my $2.3 million in scholarship money that I got. Here's the secret to how I did that. It's stupidly simple. <laughs> On the common application, there's a list of schools. And you search for them. Usually, you know, you research the school and you go and find the one you like and then you go on the common application and you search for their name and then you click apply and you have to go through this process. I figured out that there was a way to search for them based on the ones that did not have an application fee. I applied to all of the schools on the common application that did not have an application fee. <laughs> and they all gave me scholarships. Um, I'm not saying this is something you should do because my counselors hated me because they had to send out 36 different packages of all my uh, transcripts and stuff. Um, but, I mean, the shotgun approach <laughs> makes a lot of money. Um, the third thing is to Google the school that you're interested in going to, if they, if they have your major, if they're in a location that you like. Google the school name 
merit scholarships. This is not like a sports scholarship where you have to be in the sport to get money. Merit scholarships are the scholarship to get. They just pay you for being there, for studying, for being a student. I did this quickly with uh, UT. I, I don't know anything about UT scholarships, um, but I found this website called texasscholarships.org. It was the first result from there. From there, they just had a list of all the different independent scholarships that you can get for going to UT. Um, this is another one for, uh, I, I guess, Hartford. I'm not, I'm not sure where Hartford is, but yeah, just Google school name and then merit scholarship, and there's full scholarships that you can get for going to college. SMU, uh, the school that I went to, there's the President Scholarship, of course. There's also the Hunt Scholarship, which is more leadership-focused. Um, this is another full ride that you can get um, if you have a lot of leadership experience. At UTD, the Eugene McDermott Scholarship is another full scholarship. You just apply, you get in, you, they pay for everything. <clears throat> um, the last thing of how to hack the system is textbooks. Most of these scholarships do not cover the cost of textbooks. But, shameless plug, I made a website called textbooksplease.com. T-E-X-T-B-O-O-K-S-P-L-E-A-S-E dot C-O-N that searches 40 different websites at once, so Amazon and Chegg and eBay and all those other places, and finds you the absolute lowest cost for your textbooks. Um, so, no matter what college you go to, you should use my website, textbooksplease.com. Uh, to recap, so we'll have time for questions. Life is not the game of life. Really reconsider if college is necessary. I will not think any less of you. You can be more successful, probably, not going to college than you could be in college. Um, if you're going to go to college, if you decided this is the thing that you have to do, it is starting right now your full-time job making money to do it. This is right now probably the easiest time it will ever be to make money, probably in the next 15 or 20 years. Um, maximize your GPA and curriculum, your test scores, and how interesting you are, for lack of a better way to, to paraphrase that. And remember to hack the system. Questions? But thank you very much. Okay.